Tonight, a tale of two cities, Daniel Andrews' roadmap under pressure as the federal treasurer calls for Victoria to match New South Wales in easing restrictions. Vaccine take-up soars, but our hospitals are under increasing stress amid anger over mandates as the Grand Prix gets the tick for April. Also, illegal drugs off Melbourne's streets thanks to Australia's biggest ever heroin bust. Attack on democracy, a British politician stabbed to death in an act of terror. Wild weather, hundreds call the SES for help. What's in store for the rest of the weekend? And Peter Moody's comeback complete, training incentivised to win the Caulfield Cup. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Mike Amor starts now. Good evening. The Federal Treasurer is calling for Melbourne to be reopened to the same extent as Sydney when we hit 70% fully vaccinated, expected in just five days' time. Our daily case number is back below 2,000, but a 15-year-old is among today's seven COVID-related deaths. Race goers return to the track no in sunny Sydney. Track, but to get this crowd, so exciting. As if we needed another reminder, we're down on we our luck. A dreary Caulfield Cup with no crowds. It's time Victoria shifted gears and got back in the fast lane. The Federal Treasurer is urging the Victorian government to match New South Wales' roadmap once we reach the 70% vaccination milestone, currently hurtling towards next Thursday. The people of Victoria should be congratulated. They've done the hard yards and they're doing the right thing. Now they should be given their freedoms and their lives back. This isn't going to be a great big freedom day where everything can be forgotten and we can all go back to normal. Our case numbers remain high. Another 1,993 infections recorded and seven deaths. A 15-year-old girl with other medical conditions, one of the youngest Australians to die with the virus. 789 COVID patients are in hospital beds across the state, a hundred more than yesterday. 163 are in intensive care. I would expect that we would want to see those case numbers start to turn in the next week or two, as, as predicted by the original uh, the modelling. Um, we would, we would, you know, obviously we'll watch that very closely. But the real constraint on us is, is what it does for our hospital system. Pop-up vaccination hubs are rolling out in the southeastern suburbs this weekend. There's mounting concern over the latest hotspots, where 602 of today's cases are located. There's now almost 2,000 residents with COVID in Casey continued growth of community to household to household transmission uh, across a number of different communities and really I'd urge people if you're in the southeast just recognize the level of COVID uh, infections that we're seeing around here. A family of 17 live across three adjoining households. They're getting vaccinated in shifts in the Casey Demons gym. It's walking easily so I just go with my this family and another four people is coming after that. There's still no change to the baffling border rules that come into effect on Wednesday, allowing fully vaccinated people in New South Wales to travel to Victoria. This ludicrous and unacceptable situation where somebody in Sydney can travel nearly a thousand kilometres to Victoria and go to the pub in Lawn, whereas someone in Melbourne can't even go and visit their family in the same place. New South Wales has now reached 80% double vaccinated. The COVID commander says any visitors will be subject to the same restrictions Victorians are living under. Anybody who's coming back into the state has to be double vaccinated, has to have tested negative. So at the point at which they come in, they present no greater threat than the rest of us do with the level of cases we have circulating in, in Melbourne at the moment. And Jade Vincent joins us live. Jade, we're expecting to hear from the Premier tomorrow. Yes, Mike, we understand the state government has been in discussions about whether they can ease restrictions any further than those set out in the roadmap as we reach the 70% double dose milestone next week. The Premier is expected to make an announcement tomorrow set to provide a timeline of exactly when the lockdown will end and when this next phase of freedoms will be triggered. The state government says that it should happen as close as possible to us hitting that target on Thursday. Mike? Jade Vincent live at State Parliament. Thank you. Our besieged hospitals are under increasing pressure tonight with claims thousands of health workers will be fired because they're refused mandatory vaccination. That comes as elective surgery is being cancelled, devastating so many waiting for relief from major ailments. 
With elective surgery on hold, Chase Arneson feels his life is on hold. Last year, he had an ear tumour removed, leaving him deaf on his right side. It creates a lot of balance issues. Um, I've, I kind of have massive uh, uh, tension headaches up this side. He's had to drop his passions, weightlifting and hiking. Now he's been told a second operation to correct the problem has been cancelled indefinitely. It might mean that the delay makes it even a bigger problem in the future. All elective surgeries like Chase's are suspended because of COVID pressure on our hospitals. Of course that has an impact on, on our capacity across the wider health system to care for other people who also need clinical care. This is an absolute mess and it could have all been avoided if there was better planning. And it's likely to get worse, with healthcare workers now being sacked after refusing mandatory vaccinations, like registered nurse Sarah Hart, who refused because she's in remission from cancer. They've just said, sorry, we have to let you go. After 30 years, it's crazy. Sarah's started a non-vaccinated healthcare worker support group. There are hundreds, if not thousands of people um, going through it. I don't have a figure. I think thousands would be, would be a remarkable number to get to. I don't see this as being a large-scale problem. Mr Weimar dubbed healthcare workers refusing vaccination a bizarre decision. And they need to find an alternative career choice. I think the vast majority of Victorians, given what we're living through, would think that's a pretty reasonable thing to do. And a warning to employers. Yesterday alone, inspectors checked 500 workplaces for vaccine compliance. You should expect to be, to be challenged and to be able to demonstrate that you've got controls in place that demonstrate that your staff are appropriately vaccinated and, not, and safe for themselves and their workmates. The Grand Prix has joined the Australian Open, confirming dates for next year. Nick McCallum's at Albert Park tonight. Nick, this is a relief for organisers and fans. Mike, it's very quiet here now, but come April 7th to 10th next year, Pit Lane will come alive with the roar of engines and the smell of burning tyre rubber. It will be the third race of the Grand Prix season. We've lost the coveted number one race position. It will clash with footy. Crowd sizes are yet to be determined. Of course, the 2020 Grand Prix was the first major event in Melbourne to be cancelled because of COVID. This year's race was pushed back originally from March to November before being cancelled altogether. Now, organisers are so excited by the return of the race that they will, over summer, resurface the entire circuit here for the first time since 1990. 95. Mike. Nick McCallum at Albert Park, thank you. Police heavily outnumbered protesters quashing plans of a rally around Princess Park in Brunswick at midday. Those who attempted to break the rules and gather were stopped by officers. 57 people were arrested and a total of 42 fines were issued for breaching the Chief Health Officer's directions. The group is vowing not to give up their so-called freedom fight, planning a pop-up rally in the coming days. So let's take a look at the state of play in Victoria tonight. Now, daily case numbers have fallen back below 2,000. We've hit 88.1% first doses and 65% of all Victorians aged over 16 are now fully vaccinated. We are rocketing towards hitting that 70% target this coming Thursday. And we're on track to hit 80% double dosed on Sunday, October 31. $140 million worth of illegal drugs are off Melbourne streets tonight after Australia's biggest ever heroin bust. More than 450 kilograms were discovered in a shipment of tiles from Malaysia. A 38-year-old Malaysian man is marched into federal police headquarters after Australia's biggest ever heroin seizure. A haul of 450 kilograms. Now, just to give you some scale, 450 kilograms of heroin can be broken down into millions and millions of hits. 
Its street value, $140 million. 1,290 packages were hidden in 20 tonnes of ceramic tiles in a shipment from Malaysia that arrived into Melbourne on September 29. The heroin was detected at the port, but federal police let it be delivered to its destination in Tullamarine, then secretly watched as the man transported it to a warehouse in Pasco Vale South, where he was arrested the next day. That male has been charged with importing a commercial quantity of border controlled drugs and that carries a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. Officers yesterday raided houses in Dallas and Craigieburn and a warehouse in a Coolaroo industrial estate. No more arrests were made but the hunt continues here and overseas. That arrested man, what has he said? Uh, I, I can't share that with you. Has he been cooperative? Um, uh, again, I can't really go into that detail. Needless to say, obviously, he was surprised when we turned up and arrested him. Using specialist X-ray equipment and other intelligence, Border Force officers have the skill to detect which boxes hold regular cargo or dangerous illicit drugs. Great work by the staff who work here day in, day out, protecting our community. Paul Dowsley, 7 News. Investigations into an incident involving Western Bulldogs cult hero Bailey Smith are continuing in Queensland. A friend of a man injured in the incident has told Seven News the 22-year-old required six stitches after hitting his head on the ground. Gold Coast Police have confirmed they have received a complaint relating to an alleged assault outside the Burley Pavilion just after midnight on October 4. Smith has been holidaying in Queensland during the off-season. A veteran British MP has been stabbed to death, murdered while he was meeting with constituents. It's been declared a terrorist incident by Scotland Yard with a man in custody. Tonight, the killing is being described as an attack on democracy. A Methodist church an hour outside London under police guard. A holy place, today the scene of a sinister crime. It's just so shocking, isn't it? It's awful. It's just no one deserves anything like that, whatever you think about politically. Inside, the town's MP was meeting with locals when a man charged, stabbing him more than a dozen times. The air ambulance landed nearby, but it wasn't needed. Sir David Amos couldn't be revived. The popular local Conservative MP for 38 years, a father of five, grandfather, fervently pro-Brexit, renowned for tirelessly representing his community. I raised the issue of night crime in the chamber earlier this month. Arrested at the scene, a 25-year-old man, a British national of Somali heritage, police treating it as a terrorist attack. Shockwaves felt across this community and the political establishment. Flags at Westminster flying at half-mast. The reason I think people are so shocked and saddened is, above all, he was one of the kindest, nicest, most gentle people in politics. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge said they were shocked and saddened. This isn't the first time the security of MPs here has been questioned. Three British politicians have been violently attacked doing their jobs in the last decade. Sir David Amos is the second to be murdered in the last five years. Labor MP Joe Cox was stabbed and shot by a far-right activist in 2016, just days before the EU referendum. Now Britain's often toxic political discourse forced to pause again in tragic circumstances. Democracy must always survive and people who challenge that must not be allowed to win. With security for MPs under review. In Leon C, England, Hewitt Feld, 7 News. The Prime Minister's in a crucial battle with his deputy tonight, desperate to get Barnaby Joyce and the Nationals on board with his climate change policy. Ahead of his trip to Glasgow, Scott Morrison will pitch to his own party room tomorrow. Having cleared up one grey area... The Prime Minister's going to Glasgow. Another big question remains. Will Scott Morrison be taking a firm commitment to net zero by 2050 with him? I reckon Chappelle Corby had more idea about what was in her luggage than Scott Morrison knows about what's going to be in his luggage. 
on the way to Glasgow. Labor says he's waiting for Barnaby Joyce to tell him what to pack after the Nationals get their first look at the Prime Minister's plan tomorrow. Obviously we've got to move away from coal and gas and technology is the key to that. Some are already convinced. The world is moving that way anyway. The finance markets are moving there. Major industry groups are moving there. But it could take weeks to land an agreement with others dead against emissions targets. If the majority are in agreement that we'll move forward. The debate moving beyond the environmental to the economic impacts of inaction. Overseas investors are starting to say, well, if you guys aren't playing your role in getting carbon emissions down, then we're not going to invest in Australia. Muddying the waters, One Nation now threatening to double its advertising spend in seats held by the Nats if the party signs on to a climate deal. And there are growing fears internationally the summit may not deliver on its goals anyway, with major polluters India, China and Russia yet to reveal their plans to cut emissions. But Scott Morrison says he's ready to step up. The Prime Minister's visit uh, and trip to, to Glasgow is a signal of our intent to be part of the global effort to reduce emissions. With that shaping as a major election issue. Rob Scott, 7 News. Parts of Melbourne are cleaning up after a wet and windy night. Melina Saris has the details and Mel, the east was hit pretty hard. It was, Mike. Areas around the Dandenongs were once again battered with strong winds. Residents in Lilydale, Emerald and Hillsville woke up to storm damage this morning. The SES has been called out to more than 400 jobs for trees down, building damage and flooding. Mount Dandenong recorded 64 millimetres of rain over the past 24 hours. We had wind gusts of more than 100 k an hour at Wilson's Prom, around 80 k's at Port Phillip, Frankston and St Kilda. These flood warnings have been issued. Moderate flooding is expected along the Yarra River from Coldstream to Warrandyte. A flood watch is also in place for these parts of Gippsland and central Victoria. I can promise you there is some sunshine on the way. I'll have all of those details later in the bulletin, Mike. That's good news. Thanks, Mel. See you soon. An earthquake has rocked Bali, killing at least three people. The 4.8 magnitude quake struck the island's northeast. Homes have collapsed, trees have fallen and landslides have been triggered. Deep cracks which appeared on roads across the region with many routes through the countryside now blocked by debris. Residents are being warned to expect aftershocks. The Navy Seahawk helicopter fleet is back in the air. Operations were suspended after an MH60R ditched into the Philippine Sea four days ago. The fleet commander says initial evidence indicates the incident is not an issue impacting other aircraft. The three aircrew on board at the time are continuing operations on board HMAS Brisbane. Shopping centres have come up with a list almost as long as Santa's to keep children safe while having their photo taken this year. Christmas trading gets underway at the start of next month, just as Melbourne emerges from lockdown. Tis the season to be making memories. Ho, 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 Merry Christmas! But this year there'll be a twist on the traditional Santa photos. For customers, it's going to be things like the wearing the face masks, the checking in with QR codes and, importantly, physically distancing. Santa will arrive at shopping centres next month with strict measures in place to keep everyone safe. At this stage, we're working towards Santa and Santa's helpers uh, will be vaccinated. Children must be socially distanced from Santa so can't sit on his lap. And traditional portrait photos will be replaced with a landscape shot to make room. Bookings will need to be made online to cut down on queues. People over the age of 16 may have their vaccination status checked. And depending on government guidelines, masks may need to be worn. And also extra cleaning going on on the photo set. The Christmas trading period coincides with Melbourne's emergence from lockdown, lifting spirits all round. It is a good time to be looking forward while reminding children that things still might be a bit different, but it won't last forever. Melina Cyrus, 7 News. One of the great sporting comebacks of the year has been completed with a bang. Mm. Jackie Felgate, the racing world, was in awe at Caulfield. Mike, it was amazing. What a performance by Peter Moody and Incentivise. The man who walked away from the sport for five years returns to the top in a big way. And Incentivise, what a star, won the Caulfield Cup. Caulfield was my home for 
probably 16 or 17 years and uh, trained a couple of thousand winners here, but uh, never this one. Uh, also, no California dreaming for a Magpies star as footy's next big thing reveals he's got the confidence to match. A selection squeeze for the Aussies ahead of the World Cup. All that and plenty more coming up shortly. OK, see you then. Thanks, Jack. After major delays, boring machines are about to swing into action on the Westgate Tunnel Project. Up next, plans to keep traffic flowing as construction ramps up. Also, a Super Saturday of online auctions. The latest results live. Will versus Will, the Star, Str Star Trek superstar, hits back at the Prince. And the ice-breaking super ship set to revolutionise Australia's Antarctic explorations. After years of delays on the Westgate Tunnel project, boring machines could finally be about to be switched on. Construction is ramping up along Footscray Road, building the new tollway without disrupting traffic below. A giant crane towers over Footscray Road, building a new road connecting the future Westgate Tunnel to CityLink. It's about a two-year process um, from start to finish. It takes 9,000 trucks off the uh, local roads in Footscray by the the connections which we built as part of the project. The entire project was supposed to be finished next year, but it's been plagued with delays thanks to a toxic soil dispute. In the meantime, workers are upgrading the Westgate freeway. We we're about, I think, 60% of the way through the widening on the freeway. The eight lanes now become 12 and even wider in places. For the next few weeks, there's roadworks at the M80 interchange, Grieve Parade and Williamstown Road. The machines to dig the tunnels have sat idle since 2019, but could finally be switched on in the new year. We anticipate early next year the tunneling will start after Christmas. With a new facility being built to take the toxic soil in Buller. So it'll still be some months yet before uh, that site will be ready. Massive cost blowout, it's at least $3 billion and probably much more. While work is ramping up across the west, residents who live near construction are bracing for more disruptions over the next few years. Julie Richards owns a house opposite the tunnel's entrance in South Kingsville. Yeah, it might have some benefits. It was just rock crushing for six months and it just did my head in and I had to move. People are getting disrupted less by doing uh, more intense closures. It's going to be a vital second uh, crossing but, uh, for, uh, for people coming in and out of the western suburbs and the western part of Victoria. Rachel Ward, 7 News. A massive 1,500 properties went under the hammer across Melbourne today, all online. It's the city's second biggest auction weekend ever, and experts say it's only going to get busier as restrictions ease. From first bid to sold in just nine minutes. In 1,160,000, property is going, property oh. is going, and... Sold. In line with restrictions, the auction of this Yarraville home was online. That didn't stop it surpassing its reserve on the opening bid. Buyers are literally paying well above the reserve and sometimes I'll go that little bit more if it means that they can just get their property and buy their weekends back. The two bedroom home was one of 1,550 that went under the hammer today on the city's second biggest auction weekend of the year. Next week there are 1,080, the following week 1,430. Experts say the boom is thanks to eased restrictions allowing in-person inspections. That was about four weeks ago. So a lot of vendors decided, well, yep, let's, let's put our property to market. Lockdown also creating huge demand but little supply. The market's um, very hot at the moment for some reason. Um, so it's very hard to get into the market. Well, we've only been here for about 20 minutes <laughs> and we've already had three groups of people through. Experts believe this Super Saturday is a sign of things to come. As restrictions ease in Melbourne over the next few weeks, its expected auction numbers will continue to grow. Between now and Christmas, our, the way that we're looking at the market is it's going to be unbelievable. Uh, I've been in real estate this is my 17th year and I've never seen it this strong. Jody Lee, 7 News. And Jody Lee, today's auction results are just in. Well, Mike, according to the Real Estate Institute of Victoria, a clearance rate of 88% was recorded this week. That's 2% higher than last week and 16% higher than the same time last year. It is a sign there is strong confidence in the property market as Melbourne prepares to open back up. Mike? Jody, thank you.
William Shatner has hit back a criticism from Prince William over his record-breaking space flight. The Star Trek icon's Blue Origin journey promoted future space tourism, but the Duke of Cambridge believes we should be focusing on sustainability on Earth. I would tell the Prince, and I hope the Prince gets this message, this is a baby step of getting industry, all those polluting industries, off of Earth. He says Prince William got the wrong idea and is missing the point. Southern Tasmania's three-day COVID lockdown has ruined the party for a new Antarctic icebreaker. RSV Noyinya docked in Hobart this morning with little fanfare after a planned welcoming party was abandoned. The COVID lockdown is just so disappointing because everyone was really excited, but we will make up for it. Official festivities are expected to go ahead in December. Users say they're faulty and have made them sick. Next, legal action over the health device that's meant to make life better. Also, the full cost of Melbourne's record earthquake reveal. A shark attack at one of our most popular holiday spots. And relief in London. Stranded Aussies finally set for a ticket home. The damage bill from last month's record earthquake has soared, with insurers paying out $162 million for damages. There have been more than 10,000 claims, some covering significant structural damage, but the Insurance Council says most were for minor damage. Aftershocks are still being felt, with two tremors recorded northeast of Melbourne this morning. There's a new class action underway over ventilators and sleep apnea machines that customers say are faulty and have made them sick. Electronic giant Philips Australia has issued recalls over sound-reducing foam in the device that's potentially toxic. After years of chronic snoring, these CPAP machines were finally helping Sam Uzun get a good night's sleep until he started becoming sick. Difficulty in breathing, hypersensitivity in the throat, uh, sort of irritated eyes, hop, like an allergic eyes, and, and headaches. The 51-year-old carpenter put his symptoms down to getting older, but they got worse, even making it difficult to work. Mr Uzun now believes he'd been breathing in foam particles during the night. I would be sitting on the couch um, and I would... My wife would say, why are you breathing so heavy? In July, Philips Australia issued an urgent product defect correction for 15 types of machines, stating exposure to degraded foam and chemical emissions could result in eye irritation, headaches, adverse effects to organs, toxic and carcinogenic effects. It scares me. I'm genuinely concerned about cancer and other effects that could develop. But a peak industry body is calling for calm. All of the side effects that have been reported are local, so involve the upper airways like the nose and or the throat, but at this stage there's no evidence of long-term harm. Around 2,000 people are now seeking compensation over the faulty devices. If the class action is successful, it could result in a payout worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Just like asbestosis and mesophilioma, we won't know the long-term effects of the exposure until maybe decades down the track. Philips Australia says it hasn't been served with the proceedings yet, but it's treating the recall with the highest level of seriousness. Ashley Kanowski, 7 News. A man's been set upon by a shark off Queensland's Hamilton Island. He managed to pull himself out of the water after taking a dip right on sunset at the holiday hotspot, popular with thousands of Victorians. Bloodied and bandaged, a shark had his left leg, but he had hold of a ladder, gripping on to scramble to safety. I would imagine that he wouldn't have seen um, it, it, um, it coming towards him. Around 6pm yesterday, he was bitten in Hook Passage off Airlie Beach, roughly a half an hour boat ride away from help at Hamilton Island Marina. It was multiple bites uh, to the lower left leg. Um, deep lacerations, however, I, I don't believe any tissue was removed, um, however, just uh, multiple puncture wounds. A risk of swimming in this paradise, a tourism mecca stung by the stigma of shark attacks before. The private boat was anchored at a known hotspot right near the site of several other attacks. The official government advice, no one should swim in Sid Harbour under any circumstances. There was a cluster of incidents about three years ago. A woman was bitten on the thigh, a 12-year-old girl lost her leg and a Melbourne doctor died while paddleboarding, all within about six weeks. 
However, in this instance, it sounds like the patient was uh, very lucky indeed. Surviving a swim at sunset. Michelle Jensen, 7 News. Suicide bombers have attacked a mosque in Afghanistan, killing at least 35 people. Blasts tore through the place of worship, cutting down those inside. Bystanders who rushed in to help in the chaos moments after the explosions. It's the second deadly mosque attack in a week. Nobody has yet claimed responsibility. A teacher in the US has been arrested after allegedly handing out lollies to her class laced with drugs. Police say 27-year-old Victoria Farish filled a bowl with treats to reward her students, but she mistakenly added gummies made with THC, the psychoactive compound in cannabis. Another teacher spotted a student holding the sweets and confiscated them. Luckily, no students ate the drugs. The end of Fortress Australia is welcome news for thousands stuck overseas, but plans to reopen our international borders are causing major confusion. As airlines open up seats to Sydney, uncertainty remains about getting into Victoria and the rest of the country. After 19 months of separation, the prospect of a reunion is a relief. It's big and it's, it's fantastic to hear. It's long overdue, but also it's just like the tip of the iceberg. There are so many Australians that are still affected by this. A surreal celebration for some, but many are again left with questions. What do you do if you're in Queensland? What do you do if you're... If you can get a flight, um, good luck to you. You get, you get into Sydney, but your family is in uh, South Australia or, or, or Western Australia, my gosh. The decision to scrap quarantine for vaccinated citizens brings New South Wales into line with most other countries. Australia's divided state-based approach is a foreign concept to Brits. So if your family's here, you can just go in, but if yeah. your family's in any of these other places... You've got to do quarantine. Well, that's slightly mad, isn't it? It's inconsistent and slightly mad. I feel sorry for everyone in Australia because, you know, COVID we're going to have to live with. While Qantas has made announcements, international carriers were caught off guard by this development. Airlines currently flying empty planes into Sydney due to passenger caps will quickly make thousands of seats available, but additional flights will take longer to organise. Clarity, certainty and compassion on the pre-Christmas wish list. In London, Sarah Greenolch, 7 News. Your daily shower could soon cost you less. Next, how going green is set to save Victorians money. Also, a second river crossing, 60 years in the making, bringing two states together. And why some of the world's biggest TV shows could soon disappear from your screens. New research shows the cost of everyday activities like making a cup of tea and showering could be more than halved when households move to renewable energy by 2030. The Rewiring Australia reports found Victorians could save up to $6,000 a year by replacing gas and coal-fired electricity with renewable power. Heating costs would be cut by two-thirds and you could save 50 cents every time you have a shower. And making a cup of tea would cost just one cent. For six long decades, debate has raged over a second river crossing for the Murray River town of Echuca. Soon, locals will finally get their wish, changing the lives of thousands who live in northern Victoria. For almost two years, virtually every day, John and Daryl sit mesmerised. Yeah, we've been sitting here a long time waiting for this. Enthralled by work on the newest border crossing. Just something different every day. From the piles being driven uh, right through to the cement truck pumping the cement. There's a lot to it. The almost complete $324 million second bridge across the Murray from Echuca, first promised in the 1960s. Over 60 years, so <laughs> yeah, I think it's been a very long awaited thing, and so it's very exciting that we're actually nearly there. But of all times for a bridge to be built from Victoria to New South Wales, this has been the toughest, constant COVID headaches. It has been a real challenge. To have to deal with two different states, with two different lots of restrictions. Logistically, we, we might have um, three separate crews working in, in different areas and isolating them. Pandemic logistics overcome, the new bridge will detour interstate freight and travellers around Echuca. 
a long-lasting connection between Victoria and New South Wales. And ease traffic jams on the existing bridge here, built in 1878. It goes back for miles, it's frustration sets in, people get angry. The bridge will open up at a crucial time for one of the most important industries in this area, tourism. After COVID, the Murray's legendary paddle steamers and houseboats need a kick start. Tourism has been devastated, absolutely devastated. The bridge should open mid next year. Bittersweet for John and Daryl. What we're going to do when the bridge is finished, I'm not quite sure. Nick McCallum, 7 News. Some of the world's best-known TV and film productions are on the verge of coming to a sudden halt. There's a showdown brewing with thousands of workers. Now Hollywood is bracing for strike action. For Hollywood, here comes the wrong kind of showstopper. The union for 60,000 film and TV workers tweeting, if the studios want to fight, they poked the wrong bear. The strike for higher pay and better benefits set to begin in two days as... The cheap labour bubble's finally busted. More than 10,000 auto workers strike, demanding better pay from agriculture giant John Deere. The president telling strikers across the US they have a right to walk out. My message is if you think that's what you need, then you should do it. This as American cities confront a different workplace war over vaccine mandates. I think the city of Chicago is in grave danger going into this weekend. As the deadline passes for the crime troubled city's 12,000 police to get their COVID shot. You gotta get vaccinated, pure and simple. I guarantee you at least half the department staying home come Saturday morning. In US travel, they can see similar showdowns coming. 40% of airport security staff have not reported their vaccine status despite a deadline next month. So too, thousands of commercial pilots. One airline telling them it's vaccination or termination. In the United States, Tim Lester, 7 News. It's the moment Adele fans have been waiting. Lovely. Yeah, Jack Peter Moody <laughs> has already turned his attention to Flemington. Hello, Mike. Yes, he has. Caulfield one day, Melbourne Cup the next. A win for the ages at Caulfield as a superstar of the turf declares he's just getting started. Plus, the number one draft pick to be reveals why he can make a big splash at Arden Street. No such thing as a holiday, a determined Jordan Degoe gets a head start on 2022. And Australia facing a selection headache ahead of the T20 World Cup. Welcome back. Peter Moody now has a Melbourne Cup in his sights after training incentivised to a stunning Caulfield Cup victory. The dominant win described as one of the greatest in the race's history. The definition of a superstar. But incentivised is coming away. Four legs in front and incentivised. What a star. Won the Caulfield Cup from non-conformist. Dead heat third per saddle modophilia. Leaving the field in his wake. This is one of the great Caulfield Cup winners of all time. And delivering trainer Peter Moody a long-awaited Caulfield Cup. Caulfield was my home for probably 16 or 17 years and uh, trained a couple of thousand winners here, but uh, never this one. One of the shortest price favourites in the race's history, he did it easily ahead of non-conformist and Persan. Redemption for Moody, the man best known for training one of our greatest ever horses, Black Caviar, returning from a career-ending suspension to climb racing's greatest heights. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pete. 
Mate, that was special. <laughs> Jockey Brett Preble continuing his stellar spring and issuing a warning for the first Tuesday in November. Look out, Melbourne Cup. Yeah, two miles. Yeah, no, Bring he's, uh, he's going to eat it. Restrictions meant owner Bray Sikolsky celebrated from Sydney, incentivised now favourite for the Melbourne Cup. He's probably one of the most exciting horses I've ridden. And it's, yeah, it's beautiful. But it wasn't all good news. At track work this morning, last year's Cox Plate winner, Sir Dragonet, broke his leg and had to be euthanised. Pretty hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Um, he's such a, you know, got so much respect for the horse and, um, and uh, you know, from what he's done, yeah, tough day for the stable. The drama extended to Sydney with a thrilling finish to the Everest at Randwick. With James, James McDonald on board, the Chris Waller-trained Nature Strip fought off the challenges to etch its name in racing history. Nature Strip kept going and won it. Last Chris out is jumping out of the ground. Just missed. Nature Strip clings on. He's king of the mountain this time. He got the highest rating sprinter in the world for a reason and that gave me some confidence. <laughs> He's probably justified it today. Nature Strip's owners take home $6.2 million in prize money. Likely number one draft pick, Jason Horn francis has declared he can make an impact straight away in the AFL world. The 18-year-old from Adelaide says he already feels like a North Melbourne player after meeting with Roos officials last week. There's no bursting this future star's bubble. Jason Horn francis doesn't plan on wasting any time once he enters the AFL world. I feel like I, I can yeah, make, make an impact straight away, um, as in I've had that two years of league footy um, under my belt and it's really helped me. North Melbourne looks all but certain to take the 18-year-old from Adelaide with this year's number one selection in the draft. The ready-made midfielder relishing the coveted tag of the top pick. Yeah, I do. I, I feel like, yeah, I'm... Are really good at embracing, um, you know, where where I am at the moment, and it is tough. And your mum posts it on Facebook every time you, you, she sees your face there. The Kangaroos knocked back Godfather offers from both the Tigers and the Crows for the Dustin Martin prototype. It's a big honour to have yeah, clubs put up put up that that for yourself. But um, yeah, I feel like it's um it's, it's gonna be, it's a bit crazy. Horn Francis already picturing life at Arden Street. It's hard hard not to, and um, there's a lot of media stuff about it. Um, and yeah, look, they've spoken to me and they said they needed a kind of yeah, mid, mid forward and they said that I could probably fit into that role pretty well. Moving away from mum, the next challenge. Obviously it's going to be a bit tougher, I think, but um, yeah, she's slowly getting her head around it. Yeah. You unfollowed her on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I haven't just yet, no. Might be a good idea though. <laughs> Meanwhile in California, Jordan Dugowie is hard at work. The Collingwood sure. star partnering with a well-known personal trainer to get a head start on the 2022 season. Nice. Andrew Perfect. McCormack, 7 News. Come on. The last of Australia's T20 World Cup stars will join the rest of the squad in Dubai after the IPL final was taken out by Josh Hazelwood's Chennai Super Kings. Hazelwood claimed two for 29 from his four overs in a 27-run win over Kolkata. A little bit of downtime, I think, over the next week, but um, yeah, jump straight into the World Cup and um, I guess it's been perfect preparation really to, to play on these wickets and on these grounds against, you know, some high quality opposition. So I'm um, looking forward to it. Australia kicks off its World Cup campaign against South Africa next Saturday. And Adam Scott has rocketed up the leaderboard at the halfway mark of the CJ Cup in Las Vegas. The Aussie find, fired a nine under second round to sit in a tie for second, including this stunning approach to set up eagle on the par five 18th. Although Mexico's Abraham Anser went one better at the 14th. Second shot, 250 yards away. Look out for this one, look out for this one. <laughs> That is a deuce on a par five. Aussie Cameron Smith is seven shots back in a tie for eighth. I'm still coming down from that amazing Caulfield Cup. That wraps up sport. OK, thanks, Jack. Melina is next with the forecast. And Mel, what's in store for the rest of the week? Well, Mike, some more settled conditions and even some sunshine. Details next. Melissa Caddick was my wife. I can't keep silent any longer. She defrauded millions and millions, then vanished. It's time for the truth to come out. 
What Australia has heard so far is just the tip of the iceberg. I know why she died. Go inside the mansion. It doesn't get much better than this. No. Inside the money trail. How much money did you give? Two million. Who is Melissa to you? My sister. But who would want to murder Melissa? Someone got greedy and, and wanted her dead. The discovery right here on this beach should have answered a lot of questions. The most extraordinary mystery of our time. All this coastline, for it to be found by anyone, is quite extraordinary. It's beyond me. Did you murder your wife? Seven News Spotlight investigates Melissa Caddick, The Vanishing, Sunday at 7 on 7. Thankfully, the wet and windy weather has moved on. The city had 26 millimetres to 9am, half of our October rainfall average. Since then, a bit of drizzle and a top of 16 degrees. This is the low responsible, but it is now spiralling away to the southeast as a high moves in. The high heads east on Sunday as a cold front clips us on Monday. A quick check of our capitals. Sunny in Brisbane, Sydney and Adelaide. A shower or two over in Perth. In Victoria, patchy morning fog, then mostly cloudy in the south with isolated morning showers, dry and partly cloudy across the north. Temperatures are staying mild with light, variable winds tending northwesterly. We could see some showers popping up just over the southeastern suburbs tomorrow morning. Otherwise, it'll be a partly cloudy day. Most areas should reach the high teens. Partly cloudy in the city as well, a top of 19 degrees. It'll be dry for most of the day on Monday shower or two developing later 19 just the slight chance of a shower on tuesday wednesday is sunny 24 degrees and the weather looks to be wet as we emerge from lockdown at the end of the week thursday starting fine and warm showers develop later showers on friday and a shower or two next saturday mike okay thanks mel and that's the latest from our melbourne newsroom this saturday night for now from the seven news team have a great night <laughs>